right. Well, hey, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 33, Exodus 33. And so, again, last Sunday before Christmas, coming up quickly here on Saturday, and so, man, we're excited about that. And, and so that makes this the last sermon in our Advent series, Needing the Messiah. And so, man, what a great sermon series it's been, amen? Man, and so, uh, uh, man, what, what a cool, cool series we've had so far. And so over these last couple weeks, what we've been talking about is how much Israel needed the Messiah to come. And, and we, we talk about that a lot, about, yeah, we, we needed Jesus, they needed Jesus so much, and, and even the Israelites would, would talk about the Christ, uh, about the Messiah in a way that they needed him, but they had no idea what they needed him for. Right. And, and so, man, uh, over these last few weeks, that's what we've talked about is these things that Israel had no idea that they actually needed the Messiah to come and do. And, and so, as, as we've pointed out just uh, o- over and over, it's really easy to relate that to our own lives where, where when we initially get saved, we have no idea all the different things we need Jesus for. Hello, are we awake today? We have no idea all the things we need Jesus for. Can I get an Amen. All right, I'll just tell you when to respond then, okay? So, man, but we don't. We have no idea all the things that we need Jesus to come and do in our life. Usually when someone gets saved, at at that point, they know, yes, I need to be saved from my sins. I I, I need to be saved because I'm I'm a sinner. But, man, there's so much more that we need Jesus to start doing in our lives. We don't even know all all the different sins we need him to save us from at that point and, and still don't and do not have the capacity to. But, man, what an awesome Thing. And so, man, as we started talking about this series, when we, when we first started the, the, that, that first sermon, we were talking about how we need help with our own actions. And it's not that Jesus does things for us. We didn't take free will out of it. Not, not in that way. But, but we started talking about, man, they, they really needed the Messiah to come. And one of those things they needed was just a perfect example. It, it, we, we all do so much better when we have a good example to follow in anything. Uh, the, the best example, hopefully, our parents is, is one of those pictures we have throughout our life if we're in an ideal situation. But, but we said, man, they needed so much. They are so desperate for Jesus to come, for the Messiah to come, and give them a perfect example of what it looks like to live a holy life. And, and that picture, we all benefit from. And, and so we, we take for granted those Old Testament believers sometimes. They didn't grow up reading stories about Jesus. They, they didn't hear these stories about the Pharisees and, and all, these, uh, all these guys about how pretty much the way they acted was very foolish because they didn't have this picture of Jesus. And so he said, man, that's one of the things they needed so much is for someone to come and emulate what, for them what it's supposed to look like to, to, to be the radiance of the glory of God and to reflect his, his character perfectly as a person. And, and so the, the, the way we, we summed up holiness, what it looks like for a person to be holy, is the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is what a holy life looks like, and Jesus came and was the perfect picture of that. We don't see that in those Old Testament believers, right? And so we said, we, you know, we don't emulate Samson for his gentleness, Okay, and, and, and we, we went through that, and then, and then we said with that, another thing they needed was for Jesus to come. Why? Be- because we needed him to send the helper. And, and it kind of tied in with the atonement where, where we said, okay, so, so Jesus needed to come, die on the cross, in order so he can send the helper to us. Now, now that we can be forgiven for our sins, we don't have to be separated from God anymore. And so we said there is a huge difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That difference is not God. God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, but we said, but when you read them, they're a little bit different. They're real killy in the Old Testament. There's all types of crazy things happening. But we said that difference is God's people. God's people, because now in the New Testament, all of a sudden we see this internal power that the believers have because they've been forgiven already. They, they don't have to be separated from God. They've received the Holy Spirit, and we see guys like Paul who say, imitate me as I follow Christ, and, and now there's this internal power that we don't see in the Old Testament. And so we said, man, they had such a need for Jesus, where we said, look, yes, we imitate 
their faith. We emulate faith of the Old Testament heroes because, man, they had it. And, 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 and ultimately, we said that's how they were saved, through their faith, by God's grace, the same way we are. But we don't, we don't emulate their holiness. We don't look at King David and say, ah, that's what it looks like, right? And, and, and all of those people were missing the promises of what happens with Jesus on the cross. And so last week, it was a little more... Uh, theological, I guess, and so, so we started talking about to the, the law and, and, and how the ceremonial laws, in particular the sin offerings in the Old Testament, how all this works, but that at the end of the day, not one of those offerings offered in the Old Testament forgave anybody's sins, right? And, 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 and we said, man, the, these Old Testament believers didn't even know they needed the Messiah to come in, in, in order to atone for their sins because they thought the bulls and goats were doing it. But then we read out of uh, Hebrews 10.4, it says, no, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They didn't even understand that they needed the Messiah to come and fulfill all of these things. And, and, and again, he's the one that saved them too. It's their faith in God and what they hadn't seen yet that, that they were able to be saved. And so, man, they had no idea that they needed Jesus to come do that. And what an awesome, awesome thing. They have no idea. All they want is they want the Christ to come and kick Rome out. That is their view. Uh, all they think, that hey, hey, he's going to help us politically. He's going to be this political Messiah who's going to, Jesus didn't care about politics. Don't know if you've noticed. No, he, he comes to save them from their sin. A much bigger deal. Right, and so, so yeah, you, you might be under Rome's thumb for the rest of your life, but what if you can be forgiven for your sins eternally? And so that's what Jesus comes to do. They had no idea they needed Jesus to come and do all these things that he does spiritually, okay? And so that's what we talked about all last week was the atonement. And so this week, as we're getting into our last message on needing the Messiah, I just wanted to share a quick uh, kind of story from the military, and so one of the things, there's lots of things that can get you in trouble when you're in the military, okay? I was, I was in the army, and so I was an en enlisted in the army, and so when you come in as enlisted, you are lowest of the low, okay? That's what's called a private, and that word is always said with disdain, and if, if some of our veterans would be like, yep, privates are the worst, and they are, okay? But eventually, they grow up into real people, and, and so one of the things that's really important in the army is that there's, uh, there's no fraternization between a superior and subordinate. And if, if we've never heard that word fraternization, it's just that relationship is, is, is uh, not supposed to be personal. It's not to, supposed to be outside of work. And so you've probably heard words like you don't fraternize with the enemy. Okay? Well, that was never a problem for us. We didn't go hang out with the Taliban on the reg, but fraternization as far as like, like a sergeant and a private on the weekend, man, that kind of stuff happens all the time, but it's a big no-no. And, and there's a reason for that. The, the reason is all of a sudden that, that work relationship really starts to get messed up if, if there's a personal relationship outside of it, okay? And, and, and Lots of you who've, who've gone through some of the situations, maybe at work or something, where you go, man, you know, my boss has this personal relationship with, with this guy over here. They're really good buddies. And then all, all, all of a sudden, all types of um, unfair things start to happen. Maybe this guy's getting a promotion because he's buddies with his boss, or, or he's not coming down on him like he does everybody else. And uh, fraternization creates all types of, of bad situations. And, and so there is definitely some wisdom there as far as like, no, we, we can't do that. But what would happen is, you know, like maybe a, a sergeant's out at the bar drinking with these privates or, or whatever, and then he comes in on Monday, and now all of a sudden he's got to yell at them, be like, hey, no, you guys screwed up, do push-ups, whatever. All of a sudden, those things don't seem to go the way they're supposed to go, okay? And, 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 and so... I was definitely guilty of being friends with everybody that was above me, you know, in my chain of command, which was to my benefit. I'm not, I'm not saying emulate that, but the reason I was able to do that is because I could separate my work and my personal life in the military. And, and so that was to my benefit that, okay, well, hey, at the end of the day, I'm still going to go, I'm gonna still going to show my sergeant or whoever's in charge of me all the respect I can give them, e even though we're friends outside of work. And that was a really 
good thing, but most people could not do that and had a really hard time taking those orders as a subordinate to a superior, okay? And, and so that's, that's fractionization in a nutshell, and we're going to come back to the concept. But here we are. We're in Exodus chapter 33, okay? And so uh, to give a little context here, r- right before Exodus 33, if you're math whiz, is Exodus 32, okay? You guys awake? All right, so... Man, when you don't laugh at really funny jokes, I feel like you're not awake. But Exodus 32 is all about the golden calf. And so Exodus 32, that, that's what that is about. Well, there's this, this problem where Moses goes up in the mountain, uh, and he's, he's already kind of given Israel this verbal Ten Commandments. Hey, here's the things you're not supposed to do. One of those things, including idol worship. He goes up on the mountain for 40 days, comes back down, and they're doing idol worship. Like, they've got a graven image, they're worshiping a cow, like, guys, I was gone for 40 days, what happened? And there's this huge sin that they have against God with the golden calf. And so, that is leading up to uh, Exodus 33 here, which is, I think, really important. And and so, uh, right here is, is when Israel is now commanded to leave Mount Sinai. And so, they're at Mount Sinai for almost a year. And while they're there, that's when they receive the whole law, okay? It's really in detail. There's a, a lot of law for them to receive. It's, uh, it's a lot more than just the Ten Commandments, but they're there at Sinai for almost a year getting that. So they've been commanded to leave, and, and this is where we're, we're picking up. This is, uh, this is a recap of before. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, but this is how Moses would actually communicate with God before all these things while, while they're figuring out what's going on as they're receiving the law. And so we're going to pick up here in verse 7. It says this. It says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as man speaks to his friend, okay? And, and, and so a, as we read that, hopefully you see this is, this is a past tense situation here, okay? V- verse 7 says, now Moses used to do this. This is the way it used to work, right? V- verse 11 says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses. This is the way it used to happen. And, and, and then there's something that happens with the golden calf, and, and, and now uh, all of this stuff changes a little bit with the tabernacle and how everything's going to work. But this is the way it used to, to go down, is Moses would walk into this tent, and then he'd just have a conversation with God. That, that's what it said. Verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as man speaks to a friend. And when I read that, I go, that is convenient. Right? Like, what a convenient Thing. Like, hey, I've just got this little room. I go in there, I talk to God face to face, ask specific questions, get specific answers. Maybe this is how God communicates to Moses how to write Genesis and all these. Other, who, who knows? Okay? But he had such a cool thing going on with the tent of meeting. He just goes in and, and has conversations with the Lord. That's awesome. That is, like I said, that is a, a convenient thing. And, and I, I know lots of you say, well, you know, we have access to God, it, it, because we pray, he speaks to us in all these different ways, I get it, but it's not the same as, as me just being like, hey, let's go have a, a chat in my office real quick, okay, there, there's a different type of communication that happens when you're face to face with someone here, and, and, and so, so it's not the same, and, and after this, we don't see any of Israel's leaders have that same kind of communication with God anymore. We, we never see it again. And, 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 and that, that's kind of leading into our, our last passage, or our last message here. But, but how many times do you think Israel's leaders would have been like, man, I, I'm in a pickle. I wish I could just go in and have that conversation face-to-face with God, but we never see it happen again after this. 
we, we don't see people have this kind of access to God anymore there in the Old Testament. And so we still see the good leaders inquiring about all types of things, but, but it wasn't as simple as it was with Moses where he just goes into the tent of meeting and has this friendly face-to-face conversation. So last, last title today, Needing the Messiah, our, our title is The Restoration of Friendship. The Restoration of Friendship. What a need God's people had for God to be their friend. What a need they, they've got. You can think of that old hymn, what a friend we've got in Jesus. But, but can you imagine some of those different heroes of the Old Testament? David, when, when, when he's crying out to God in the Psalms like, he's so, like he does so many times, God, what should I do? Lead me where I'm supposed to go. What, what? And he's just desperate for God. If he just had that little room where he just walks right in there and just like, okay, I don't know what to do here. Or, or, or if he goes in there and God's like, ooh, you should probably go to war and don't be looking out your window, okay? Uh, wh- whatever that advice might be that, that God is going to give, but he doesn't have that. And, and, and so we have a, fr- a desperate need to be friends of God, which is number one is that Jesus made it to where we could be friends with God. Right? That's a good thing. Like, that's an amen point. I know where it's like, oh, man, this is sad, and then it's happy, it's sad, but so... Amen when we amen. But yeah, man, Jesus made it where we could be friends with God. And, and, and so 1 Corinthians 13, it's like the love chapter. At the end of it, Paul's like, guys, at the end of this thing, we're going to be face to face with Jesus. Like, like in heaven, like that, that, that relationship completely restored at that point. And we can have those things where it's just, man, face to face with God. What an incredible thing. It's kind of terrifying for us now. Like, like mo- most of Israel wasn't trying to be like Moses in the sense where, hey, they're trying to go in the tent of meeting. No, they, they recognized that not everyone would go in there and just have a conversation, okay? But, but, but what an awesome thing that we can have that relationship restored to the point where, where we're actually going to want to have a face-to-face conversation with God. What a cool, cool thing. But that's why we needed the Messiah was to restore that relationship, the, the relationship was broken. And, and, and so 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. And, and so if that word is new, that word reconcile, that, that's what that means. It means there's a broken relationship. And if, the, if there's reconciliation, it means that relationship has now been fixed. And so they needed the Messiah to come reconcile, to come, to come fix that broken relationship. And, and, and so... Uh, Lots of times we, we think about sin and how it separates us from God, and we think, well, yeah, it just separates us from the presence of God, but what it does is it, it, it separates us from the relationship also, right? Not, not just from being in his presence. Man, it broke the relationship there with God, and, and, and so Scripture talks about our relationship with God apart from Christ, not, not as, if, as if we were just neutral towards God, if someone's not in Christ, it's, it, there's not a neutral relationship to be had with God. It, it's very clear. It's like, no, you were enemies of God. You're, you were enemies of God, but Jesus came to reconcile that, that relationship to God. And, and so Ephesians 2.13, it says, In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And again, I think this is something Old Testament believers just didn't grasp is that, 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 that they could have this relationship with, with God in the future because of what the Messiah was coming to do. Sure, sure, surely they, they knew that God was holy. Um, that surely they, they knew after for, for 1,500 years to follow the law that they continued to fail, that, that, that living up to that holiness wasn't a possibility, and so they've got all these different days of atonement and things like that. They, like, they get it, right? They, they get that they, they don't know God, but I, I don't think they understood how much that, that they needed it. And, 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 and for us in the room, I, th- I think it's really important for us to understand God's heart behind it, but because that, that's leading to number two, it's that God wants to be friends with us. What a crazy thing. What, what a cra- God wants to be friends with us. And so maybe you've grown up in church and that's not a new concept. But, but if you're here 
hearing that for the first time today, God actually desires to be friends with you. That is so cool. And, and, and he, he wants that relationship with all, all of us. And so it's so important if we're going to really try to understand the heart of God. If we're trying to understand the, the Bible, you can't get it if you don't understand that God wants that relationship with you. He, he, it's not just so you can be in his presence, you can, so you can be in his presence so you can have a relationship. It's such a, a cool thing. And, and so when that fall of man happened... And, and sin comes into the world, separates us from God, not just from his presence, but also from, from the most important relationship that we can have. And, and the whole Bible is about God restoring that relationship between mankind and himself through the work that the Messiah does on the cross. And so Israel needed so desperately for God to come just to restore this, this friendship. He desires to be our friend. And then when Jesus comes, he gives us that perfect picture of friendship. You, you want to talk about a good friend? How about Jesus? Man, he, he comes and he, he shows us exactly what that, he, what that looks like, living a completely selfless life, serving these guys that, that he's leading. And, and then he, he gives us the perfect picture of love, the perfect act of love as he lays down his life for those friends. And in doing so... He, he made it to where we could know God even better, that, that God can know us and that we can be friends of God. It's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. And, and when you think about uh, how awesome it is to know important people and, and to have important friends, how, how cool is it when, when, when you, you've got, maybe you know the mayor or the governor and then all of a sudden all these doors are opening for you because this person carries some weight. How, how about spending three years with a guy? He's your best friend. He, you've never had anyone be more of a friend to you than this one guy. And then he comes back and says, says oh, yeah, I've, I've actually got all authority. All, all authority in heaven and earth has actually been given to me. Right? So you want to talk about a friend to have. What a friend we've got in, in Jesus. Man, he, he, he says, guys, guys, I'm kind of a big deal. I've got all authority in heaven and on earth and he, he desires to be our friend what a cool thing to know about the heart of god that's an probably an encouraging thing to hear for those apostles right and so that leads us to number three number three which is that god is the best friend but he's still god right god is the best friend but he's still god and i think this is where people get confused this, this is where, where, where people struggle so much in their view of God, not understanding both, that, that he is God and he also desires to be a friend, okay? And, 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 and w when we start talking about God being our friend, it's so important that we can do so in a way where we're still giving him the respect of our majestic creator, right? A, 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 the, the respect of a holy God, what an important thing for us to try to get because that's where it gets messed up. I, I'm not talking about Jesus like he's my buddy. Okay? Yeah, he's the best friend I ever had, but he, he, he's, he's not the kind of friend that, that, that man, he, he's not my peer, right, at, at all. You, you want to talk about something that's repeated a lot in the Bible? How about fear the Lord? Okay? I'm, I'm friends with lots of you, but, but we don't fear each other, I don't think. We, we, I don't fear my friends in the same way that I do God. And so it's so important for us to still have that respect and be able to separate. That, that's why I brought up the whole story about the military where, man, it's so important to be able to understand that, yes, yes, man, he's my friend. He's for me. He's trying to do everything. He, he would die. He did die for me. But still be able to give him that respect of as, as the superior in the relationship. If he says it, I do it, right? I, I don't have another friend on earth I treat that way. But, but if, if, if God says it, I do it. Uh, a, a few sermon series ago, we, we started talking about how, how it's like God has adopted us as children. But, but if the way we approach God, the way we, we submit to God is as servants. And if we come to God as a servant, we get treated like a son, and so that's, that's what, exactly what we're talking about here. God is the best friend we've ever had, but he's still God. 
I, I don't have another friend that knows what's best for me. I don't have another friend that is omniscient. I don't have another friend who's died for the world. I don't have another friend who's got all authority in heaven and earth. And so I treat God a little bit differently than I do my other friends. And that's with all the respect in the world because he's majestic. He's God, right? So important that, that we, we get that. And, and Jesus puts all of this into uh, perspective for us. And, and what Jesus says, he says, look, if you love me, do what I command you. Right? So simple. So, 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 so it's like, yeah, I love Jesus. Okay, do what I command you. And then you can be my friend. He, he, he says, you are my friend if you do what I command you. Hmm. It's pretty simple. It makes, makes sense. Right? You are my friend if, I, if you do what I command you. Again, I don't say that to my other friends. I don't say, Jaden, you can be my friend if, if you do what I command you. you know? No, 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 that's not. But with Jesus, God, he says, if you're my friend if you do what I command you. So awesome. And, and, and it's, again, really great that God wants to have that relationship with us. And so what do we do with that? What, what do we do with that? Because uh, if we can have that relationship with God, like any relationship, we only get out of it what we put into it. We get a little more with God, I think. But what James tells us in James 4, 8, he says, he says this. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. If you draw near to God, then God is going to draw near to you. That can be such an encouraging verse for us to get here, and so, so to, to have that knowledge, one, that, that God wants to have a relationship with us, that God wants to draw near with us, and so if you feel today like you're in some type of spiritual rut, draw near to God, and then he'll draw near to you, and that relationship starts to, to be a real thing, but it's only going to be good if we're putting stuff into that relationship with God. Awesome verse prioritize time with him like you do any relationship and, and, and draw near to him. I said, well, I don't, I don't know if I know how to draw near to him. Yes, you do. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. We hear that a lot. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. And, and so, again, if you're saying, man, Steve, and I, I don't feel like I've got that great relationship with God, start there. Pray, read your Bible, go to church. And that's, where the, that's just the foundation of what that relationship is. That's, that's how we're going to start drawing near to God. Without those things, then we can't. We can't. And so such, it's such easy, easy uh, practice to do is, is to start with those basics of just pray, read your Bible, go to church. And then we can draw near to God so he can draw near to us. But that's what the Messiah came to do is, is to restore that friendship that we can have with the Lord. He, he, he comes, he dies on the cross for our sins in order that that relationship, us once being enemies, can now be friends with God. And how stupid is it of us if we don't? To, to, to be able to have a friendship with the, the person who says, I've got all authority in heaven and on earth. I, I, I want, actually want to be your friend and you can be my friend, just do what I command you. Like, I'll have some of that. I, I will, right? <laughs> but man, I want to draw near to God. I want to have a close relationship with God because that's the best thing for my life. We need him. Israel needed the Messiah to come in order to restore that friendship with the Lord. And then we can look forward again to, to heaven, heaven, when, when all things are made new, where we can have that face-to-face -face relationship that, man, hopefully... At, all, at that point, all of us will want to have. But man, such a need to be friends with God, such a need to have the Lord to go to. And, and, and we've said it before, but God seems to be a lot more interested in communicating to us than we are hearing from God. Hmm. And so, man, God wants to have a relationship with you. Let me pray for us.